welcome to RAJ Insights Podcast, partnered with the London Economic Development Corporation, the lead economic development agency for London, Ontario. Go to ledc.com for more information. Good morning. Welcome to the RAJ Insights Podcast. Uh, We're very thrilled to have with us today, Steve Panato. Steve and I go back a little bit. Uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity to have Steve come on and share his story. So welcome, Steve. Thanks, Brian. Um, you and I have a, of an interesting history. Uh, I thought of you when we started to talk about RHA insights, I know you've got uh, a wonderful background and a very, uh, kind of diverse background. So I thought we'd start off by you just introducing yourself, let us know what you're currently doing and maybe give us a little background on where you came from and, and your story. Sure. Sure. I'm happy to, it's great to see you again. Um, you know, I'll hit the personal stuff first. I, you know, grew up in, uh, in the States, in Connecticut, and sort of big family, and I uh, was fortunate to have a good educational op- options and, you know, family very focused on education. So ended up at some, some decent schools. Um, I found my way to business school and my MBA at the Tuck School at Dartmouth, and that was really a, a pretty good launching point for my career. I worked as a financial analyst for three years prior to that, went back to school full time. And that led to uh, the beginning of my career on Wall Street. So I worked in investment banking, doing M and A work, and some structured finance work in a place called Solomon Brothers. You know, forever ago, <laughs> it's a long time ago now. But it was really, really great training. Some of the smartest people I ever worked with, some of the fastest pace work, and um, being around CEOs and heads of fancy law firms sort of gets you to the point where you believe, you know, rightfully so, that you can be in the room with anybody. And you know, with, with not being in one of those environments, sometimes you question that, but that's what that did for me. Perfect. And uh, the financial training as well has been a big underpinning. So I didn't do that for very long, three or four years, had a great experience, quickly morphed into corporate strategy and corporate development. And then in the mid nineties, this internet thing and technology thing seemed like what I needed to do. So I found my way to do that at a company called Electronic Data Systems. And it was an entree into payments, electronic payments, and integrated payment and software technology. Um, I never thought that's what I would do. I thought I was going to be a stuntman for a long time. It's really what I wanted to do. Um, but I sort of found my way into that and with a series of good mentors, bosses, and opportunities and hard work, you know, rose through the ranks there at, at some good companies, had a chance to participate at an IPO, a company called Nextcar, which was pretty innovative. And then uh, found myself at a fork in the road where I had a decision to join a small company that I had been on the board of. And, you know, small is a two and a half million dollar company that was really interesting doing integrated payments and software and the fitness and membership industry or take another corporate job. And for personal reasons, as much as else, we didn't want to move. And my wife really didn't want to move, um, took a risk on that business. And I thought, hey, I can recap this thing in two or three years and we'll get some money out of it and go back to, you know, doing a corporate job. So, you know, uh, almost eight years later, after sliding <laughs> our way from doing that, we grew that business uh, fivefold and sold it to Constellation Software. Um, and that sort of began my time at, at Constellation, which is where you and I met. And then that one company became a, you know, multi-hundred million dollar division of, of Constellation, uh, which I was fortunate enough to be able to, to run and be the group CEO of. And that's how I met Intersoft and, and met you and had a terrific run there. And then three years ago, um, there was another opportunity at a company we were trying to acquire. That's actually how I got to know Bill Trust, where I'm the president now. And uh, it was a company in a really interesting time in its life, getting toward $100 million in revenue, uh, thinking about the public capital markets, thinking about how to it was still pretty entrepreneurial, founder-led, you know, at, at $75 million when I joined it, um, building software, integrated software for B2B companies, and uh, just a neat time where it needed some closer attention to metrics, a more concise go-to-market strategy, and a, a real focus on monetizing the payments within the business, which are things that I happen to have had a lot of experience with. So it made the leap and, you know, took a president job after having been a CEO for a really long time, you know, 12 years or so, but did that, joined a, a founder, our founder, Flint Lane, 
And we've had a good good few years. We've grown the business significantly. And uh, this January, we had our IPO and are now a publicly traded NASDAQ company. So we've had some good success there and have built a long-term capital foundation to really try and be the category leader, the globally dominant leader in what we do today. So a lot of stuff's happened along the way, but that's yeah. sort of my, my you know, combination of work and, and personal background all in one. Uh, tell me the difference between the CEO and president role. That, that, that I'm, I'm just, just quickly, I'm interested yeah, in that. Yeah, I know, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, in, in, in our world, uh, our CEO is a engineer and a product person by training and by sort of expertise and by love, right? So he tends to focus on those things and I run everything revenue and everything customer facing. So from the top of the funnel of lead generation sales and marketing, all the way through sales, implementation, service delivery, customer success, as well as our MA activities, they all roll to me. You know, but we've got a, a CFO and a CEO and myself, and we sort of run the business together as a team gotcha. as well. But, but that's how it's divided up today. Gotcha. Huh? That's very interesting. Um, we, we had an interesting background with the acquisition of uh, my company back in 2017. Uh, that was an interesting journey. Uh, you and I have spoken about that uh, many times. But if you reflect back on working with a lot of early stage companies, um, both through acquisition and post acquisition, we like to talk about what I refer to as these wisdom nuggets. Now, lots of people have, you know, you can term it however you want, but what we're trying to do on the podcast is to share, you know, some of these stories that might help early stage founders, um, you know, maybe avoid some of the mistakes that we've made or that we've observed, uh, or at least get them thinking about it. You know, sometimes you can't force that on any company, but sharing, uh, I think is a really good idea. And I really, that's the part that I really enjoy. What I'm doing right now is the kind of being along the journey. And sometimes you can, you can share with them and just hope that they can, plan for it. It doesn't always happen that way, but I think it really does make a difference. So if you're thinking back, what, what, what are some of the things that kind of come to your mind? Yeah. First, I think it's a great thing that you're doing. I mean, cause you just don't know what you don't know. Um, <laughs> we've all made so many mistakes along the way. So I would just encourage entrepreneurs, I'll, I'll get into some detail, but be open, have an advisory board, get this advice. I mean, it's so important because um, there are so many mistakes one can make. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on, on capital, I think, today and, and raising capital. It's actually one of my least favorite things to do, but uh, it has been a necessity for almost all of my career, right? Um, and I think it's really, really important to, at some point in your business journey as a, a leader, CEO, founder, to make a decision on what you want to have happen with your equity and your business. Do you want to have a lifestyle business that, you know, kind of does what it does and you keep it forever in your, in your family or pass it down to your team or whatever? That's one very valuable path. And then the other path is, are you really trying to drive an exit or a monetization of equity? And before you take any money, you, you should have a view on that because they are very, very different paths. So I'll focus on, you know, where I've ended up uh, is on the kind of exit path. And that's where, where my focus has been. Um, Cause that is something where at your first capital raise, you should have a sense of, Hey, I need to do this many, or I'm driving to this outcome. And that takes some discipline and some foresight. Um, you and I've talked about this milestone concept. And I think that's really, really important. You get your first seed money and it's, you know, the diligence will be pretty easy and people are really investing in you and you and an idea and your ability to execute on that idea and to build a team. So, you know, that's great. You have that, but what's next? And how do you be the driver of what's next? And one way I think that you need to do that is think about these milestones. So I took money here. What does my business need to look like here? when I get my next set of capital and how do I get a valuation increase? And that's based on some set of underlying metrics. Like what's important to your business? Is it new logo acquisition count, customer count, recurring revenue count, product enhancement? What, what features have you created 
um, that then increase your addressable market. The addressable market is a question, right? What can I serve? How big can I get? Where can I get there? Your customer retention, um, your implementation timeframe. There are a lot there, right? But those are things that prove your ability to scale your business, which is what that next investor is going to be looking for. And they prove how far you are on that journey to getting to that next increment. So let me pause there for a sec. Is that sort of uh, making sense to you? Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just think being conscious of that, right? And communicating it to your team as well. Hey, these are the things we're gonna pay attention to in our business. And, you know, hopefully the investor themes correlate to the operational ones. They, they don't always, right? They, they, they're not always the same or said a different way. Sometimes it's hard for a CEO or a management team to understand why they don't correlate. Because you're sitting there thinking like, hey, all that matters here is sales, right? I just, I just need to get people to, to say yes, that will prove everything that I, that I can prove. But if you're, you're, you are successful selling a lot and you don't get the business live, or your customer satisfaction through the implementation process is bad and your referenceability is bad, those things can come back to haunt you. Or if the way you're selling is not yeah, giving you improving margins over time, or at least they, you can't demonstrate your ability to have increased gross margins or net margins over time that you can scale the business, then that may come back to bite you. So that's a good example of where just selling for the sake of acquiring new logos might not be the right indicator to increase your value at the next round because of either pricing, positioning, market, market fit, whatever else it is. So those things need to come together and you just have to have in your mind, hmm, what do I need to look like to get this valuation? And I would ask, you know, if you, you raise, you know, once you get your, your first seed or early investors in, you know, those folks ought to be able to give you guidance. They also ought to be able to get you in front of that next round investor, right? That person who you're not ready for yet, but get you some time to them and ask them when you're not in the deal flow, right? Because you don't get the right answer where you're in the middle of the deal. But before you get to the deal, say, hey, look, what do we need to look like to be attractive to you? How would you look at a business like ours? I know you only play, you know, in, in C rounds. But boy, having that vision of what your desired C round investor wants when you're doing your C or your A round, that's good information, right? That can help you drive to that outcome consciously, not by accident. And it doesn't leave you open to the, you know, PE or VC guy coming in and driving you. You want to drive them. That's a good point. I find that the earlier stage companies tend to just focus on, you know, just revenue and, and, you know, product development, you know, and you and I were talking about this, that kind of everything in between isn't, um, you know, either they don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the know-how, you know, to, uh, you don't know what you don't know. You, you know, yeah. you talked about that. I would say that in, in my journey, I had kind of a kick of the candidate first with a company back in the you know late 90s early 2000s and i probably made lots of mistakes what well, i know i made lots of mistakes we were acquired it didn't end up to be particularly great it was okay but then you know our path changed when we launched in the soft i would still say that you know i was very cash flow driven because that was probably the driver in my early success or my early company where cash flow was always a concern. So I'm very cash focused and I, and I recognize that. So I'm, I'm all about making sure that the bills can get paid and how much runway that I'm going to have. So some of the metrics that you're talking about maybe weren't as front and center. I had milestones. So we had milestones, but they were, you know, they were more driven by the cash flow or the revenue. Right, because it would support growth, it would support organic growth, et cetera. And I didn't think so much in those terms. And I, I wonder if I had thought differently whether that might have, have, have changed things. Um, but I think ref when I reflect back on it, we did make a lot of good decisions. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to get to where we were. But I would I would love to be able to talk to earlier stage companies about um, the, the things that you should really be focused on let's, let's if you're about, if if you're talking about taking on outside money. Yeah, I think we I think we should talk about Innisoft if, if you don't mind because there's some good learnings in there. I mean, you and Jeff built a great company, like just full stop, right? Really right. good product market fit, a um, uh, uh, close knit market community where you had great reference ability, a team rallied around the customer first and getting that, I mean, a great company. Um, you did things, there's this survive versus uh, grow with external capital balance tightrope that you have to walk. And I, you, you know, you're not the only one. We did it at Member Solutions too, which was like, okay, I need to have enough cash coming out of this period to make sure I can get through the next period and you did smart things like, you know, you had customers funding new product enhancements routinely, right? Pre-buying stuff to do that. And, and that's that's cheap capital, right? I mean, that's a smart thing to do. You were cash focused by necessity. I would say what you didn't do, which kind of hurt you and made us took us longer getting our deal than a potentially injected risk for Constellation as acquirer is translate that survivor mentality, which is incredibly important, into a financial reporting framework and a financial tracking framework that's more consistent with, you know, um, you know, gap or, or accounting rules, right? And that you need that plus some underlying benchmarks that, you know, you, you know them well now because we taught them, but, you know, those are not just constellation things like, you know, percentage of revenue on different parts of the business. Those are standard metrics that at some point, you as a CEO, CFO, whatever, have to be very articulate at. And I think not having them, and in our case, this is probably true, what it does, the way it hurts the, the company versus the acquirer is, for the acquirer, it injects risk. It's like, okay, wait, these, these books are a mess. They're doing cash accounting. You know, do they have the right advisors in here? Now I, now I have to say there's some uncertainty about when we translate from cash to, you know, book or gap counting, you know, is this right? Am I going to find something new? And you put a bigger risk premium on that and that pushes price down in your valuation. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a reality. So balancing survival, thriving, protecting your team, staying focused on a business with at some point, you got to just grow up a little bit and pay the accountant and pay the lawyers. And you hate doing it because, you know, it feels like you know, you're buying insurance or something, but you need it. Right. Well, uh, I mean, in my defense, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I, I'm happy to take it on the chin because, yeah. uh, you know, the reality is that, that that's the situation. In our defense, Jeff and I had actually gone into Innisoft with no intent to ever sell Innisoft. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, and you talked about that early, is it going to be a lifestyle business or is it going to be, a, a, you know, and we had actually decided that we were going to keep it going because, you know, in that particular market, there was longevity and loyalty. And, you yeah. know, for us, it, it was going to, you know, a, a slowly wean our way away from running the day to day, get to do other things while we continue to have this, you know, because actually having the company uh, was important to us. And so, you know, the reason why we actually ended up selling it to Constellation was because of your 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 model, which was you know software for life, yeah. Where you actually bought the company, you keep them co you keep them going, you know. We we and I had told you that we had other conversations with other entities and had actually had some higher offers, yeah. Uh, but they were going to be rolled. Innosoft was going to be rolled up into something else, and that was just not appealing to Jeff and I. Um, so I agree with you. We were not particularly strong when it came to some metric drivers. And so, you know, ironically, we've shared some of those, uh, not the specifics, but just the, the, the notion around get some of these kind of metrics that drive the success of your business and get it yeah. early on and try to just, you know, measure that, um, because I think it would ultimately end up helping you when it comes to um, an acquisition potentially or an exit. It helps you be articulate about why you made decisions and the impact on 
financial or operating performance and how that fits with your strategy. So you say, hey, listen, I'm a product company, right? I, I can beat the market. I can increase my TAM by having this feature, this feature, that's sure. I'm going to overspend there, over, you know, relative, right? Because that's the company I want to be. And when you reflect that, and then as a leader, if you can articulate that, you just have instant credibility, right? It just, it, it, it makes good sense. And you said something a minute ago, which I think is, gets back to the beginning of this conversation, which was you and Jeff had a view, right? You know, it was your second time around. You're going to build this business. It's a great market. You know it well. It's not really a growing market. It's a penetrating market. There's not a whole much more universities being created, right? right? It's a market that you can penetrate in a runway in. And you ran it that way and it made sense. And you found an acquirer who respected that. So I actually think, you know, it, it sort of makes sense and it flows. And you guys were able to stay in the driver's seat and drive that outcome because you had that in your head. It sort of gets back to where we started in this conversation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So if, 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 if you're talking to early stage companies that who have decided um, that they're going to take on some money, I, I do find though that um, there's a, there's a lip, I don't know how to quite describe it. There's a little bit of a laissez faire attitude about taking on outside money as if it's just expected because it's the norm, yeah. uh, because they read about it, you know, all these people raising all this money and, and not really understand how difficult it is to raise money and the, the, the impact of raising money. And I, I, I talked to some of these early stage companies and say, listen, like you take on money from outside, your responsibility goes up a heap. Do not treat it lightly. You know, you're taking outside money. So you, you really have to take that very seriously. Um, so if they get their head around that and, and they understand, are there certain things that you would say that these investors and let, let's not get into kind of like series B or series C's, yeah. but early stage seed, late seed, maybe a series A, are there some kind of drivers that you say are really kind of important that, that outside people are looking for? I think in the early stage days, it's really, you know, it's, it's a lot about the team, you know, team product market fit addressable market. Like what kind of, what kind of, cause, cause if I'm the seed investor, I'm like, all right, what are my odds of getting a, a, a outsized return? Cause it's early stage. So I'm taking on more risk. Can this person, people, you know, guy, woman, man do this? Is there fundamentally a need for what they're saying and how big is that need? Um, and then as the entrepreneur, I think the answer, you, the question you really got to ask is, why am I taking this money? What is it that I'm going to change about my business, right? What am I going to accomplish with this money that one is, you know, consistent with my investors' expectations? I'd say that's two. One is that's going to increase the value of my business such that I can do something else. Maybe that's hire people. Maybe that's scale the business. But it's probably get me to this next point where I'm either cash flow break even, I don't need any more money, get me to this point where I've created a company that's financeable with debt, or probably get me to this next point where I can then raise another increment of capital that's going to drive me to another milestone that increases my valuation, and it gets me closer to an exit or my end goal or proving right that I can play at another level. Like It has to be with purpose. And those right. sources and uses of funds, you can't take them lightly. It's not a, oh, let me just answer, I'm going to hire some people and increase sales and marketing. No, it's what are you doing with your operational plan the moment you have that money? And how is that driving to an outcome that I already have in my head? Right? That purpose is really, really critical. Yeah. So and you're then, looking. Then, you, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you're looking for more specificity. I, I, I agree with you on that, that I find that the, you know, the forward projections, use of proceeds, they're a little bit um, light, uh, you know, especially what you see. Now, I, I'm, I'm referring to what, you know, we're, we're seeing. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the norm, but yeah. there's definitely a tendency where 
they talk about the pain they're addressing the addressable market they 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 certainly address that part it's the the piece that you you seem to be focused on and on is more the specificity around how am i actually going to use this money to get yeah. me to this particular or specific milestone that we're trying to achieve is that is that yeah. what i'm hearing it, it, it is or or a, or a next level right because because you're taking the money and then you know there's a question about the amount of money you take too right I mean, yeah. amount of money size and raise valuation which relates to what you're going to do with it and what outcome you can create with it right so that that gets to that specificity and i think in your mind you ought to say boy i i know that if i have take my customer count from 10 to 35 and i able to prove that i can build pipeline right through marketing to be 3x my next year's goals and i prove that i can do that i've now changed the perception of my company's ability to be successful i've de-risked for the next investor uh, on the sales and marketing front because i've done that or i've got two product features that everybody knows are killer product features the world is demanding i've got customers who said they would pay for it okay then within x period of time i'm able to get MVP beta customer live on that feature. Now I've proven to my current investors, my futures investors, that I can take their capital, build product, and get it in market. That's value. That's a value increment. You now have credibility. You know, I did it three times. Here it is. I got seven customers on it. <laughs> They're doing this. I said I was going to do it. I did it with the team. We hired the developers. We did the work. Those are proving things that are drive your value. Right. You mentioned something about amount of capital. Is there any, is there anything there? Cause the, that's also a conversation that we have. Well, how much capital should I take? Is there any, yeah. I, and I know there's no one answer, but your no, kind of thoughts on that. There, my general view is as little as possible, right? That's the sort of general view. And, and why, why do you say as little as possible? Because you get the opposite yeah. from others when they talk about, no, you got to take at least 18 months worth of runway. And I'm like, to me, that's arbitrary. Like I just, it that, is. That, that doesn't, that I don't know what that means. It's because of they're trying to indicate that you don't want to run out of money. So where's that balance between taking the, the, the least amount if you can, because this, this is about dilution Yeah. and you know, you know let's what I mean? And you don't want to, let's talk you, about you this. The decision criteria that, that's where you're going right so yeah exactly there's there's a few things there's you know because the amount of money how much runway it gives you what you're using with it for and how quickly or long and how expensive or not it takes to get to that next milestone then you got valuation you're a growth company you're proving your way every milestone is greater valuation less dilution right now that's a tricky one too because if you have a big tan you think you can build a big business getting there faster might behoove you. If you've got a medium size or a small team and the business size is capped, then you've got a different decision point. Give you another one. Raising money is a pain in the rear, right? It's a massive <laughs> distraction from your business. Your CEO and CFO go away and, and do that. Um, it's annoying, right? You get a lot of no's. So it's, it's a thing. How often do you want to be in market doing that? And does that distraction hurt the business, mm -hmm. right? And you have to balance that. So size, runway, milestone, valuation, distraction, um, whether you're getting help or not, cost. You know, you got lawyers and accountants and you've got to pay your advisors. All that jumble gets into your mix. And it also gets back to our, our earlier in the, in the conversation, fork of the road, right? that lifestyle versus equity exit and your time horizon around that equity exit. If you're patient, right? And you're saying, okay, look, I've got five years, 10 years to do this and I can build my business over time. And then, okay, that's one thing. If you're saying, no, boy, this market opportunity is compelling. Competition is increasing. Um, there's a limited window for this. Um, I, I wanna, you know, okay. Then if you wanna go fast, well, that argues for, if you wanna go fast against a major opportunity that argues for more money. If you think, boy, this market's going to be here for a while, it's just developing, I'm going to grind my way through it. Well, that argues for less money and kind of working it over time. So there's all those dynamics, which is again, why 
getting help from advisors, people who've done it before, talking to investors early before you need the money, right? Even for us, you know, for going, you know, we're our IPO this year, we spent the last two years doing presentations at public company investor things, you know, going with a meaningful part of our time going to sell side investment bank conferences and presenting on our company and educating the market that we were coming and getting feedback on, boy, if you were, if you looked like this, or we like to see this, that was incredibly helpful to us as a hundred million dollar company. You know, that same holds true for a, you know, half a million dollar company, just at a different scale. Right. So uh, Joe likes to refer to it. They need, they need to see you coming a long way off. Yeah, perfect. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, and, that's really and, good. And you tease them with those metrics and milestones. And say, hey, I'm here, but you know what? Within a year, I'm going to be here, and then we should talk. And then six months later, you roll in, and you're you know <laughs> above where you said you're going to be. Now you're controlling the conversation, and you set the time frame, and you've got you put a preconceived sort of bound on what you said you were going to do, and you've exceeded it. And you walk in with credibility and a bit of high ground. Which is always helpful when you're an entrepreneur talking to you know an investor who's on deal 1082, right? And you know right. they're just at an advantage to you. Absolutely, yeah. I, I know my first go around, I I I pitched. I tell the story that I pitched to 84 and I got 80 83 no's, um, and it was like a, a two year, and and they refer to it as being drunk on fundraising because you you that that's what you end up doing. Um, but I know that the one company that I eventually got a term sheet from, I had been, I would say courting them or whatever it might be over literally a two year window. And I would just continuously update them on, Hey, I just yeah. closed three more deals. Hey, I just closed this deal. Yeah. Hey. Uh, and, and so whether I was, I just somehow or another knew that I needed to continue to demonstrate that we we're progressing forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of that you know, really solid advice. I, I find that a lot of the early stage companies, they just want to go fast and quick. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you just have to, you know, and you can't pick not slow them so down. It's get them, yeah. get them focused. And you, and you can't pick your early investors lightly. I mean, these are people right. that you are, you said before, you're making commitment to them, information requirements, but they're part of your life now. You know, it's, it's, you know, there, you you want to have people who are going to be informative and helpful and positive on your business and have a similar time frame, you know, and have, and share your values. Frankly, when when you say, you know what, we let's say COVID happened, right, and you had, you had raised a, a bunch of money and you're saying, boy, I, I really have to change my plan. I want to protect this part of my team, and that means I'm going to burn X more than our plan was together. But it's the right thing for the business and it's the right thing for this team. And you, I'm going to do that as a leader. Well, boy, you want to have an investor who is going to be on the same page or, you know, and they're not, it doesn't always work, but the values there mm -hmm. are really important too. Cause you know, underneath all this is a company full of people that you're the leader of. Um, and without them and without some sense of, 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 of team and values, it's hard to be successful. If that mismatches with your investors, boy, now you're, you know, you're torn. And that's a challenge as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you and I could probably ramble along probably for the duration <laughs> of the day because we've got, we've got some interesting stories, but listen, I, I really appreciate your uh, time today and I don't want to yeah. take up too much more. Um, any kind of parting thoughts or, or to summarize? No, I love what, what, what you guys are doing. Uh, hopefully I'll get back to London at some point when they let us uh, Americans back in the country. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's great to see you um, being around new businesses and entrepreneurs. is just super fun and, and exciting. Um, and uh, you know, we, we need more of it. So you've got a great community out there. I'm happy to help. And hopefully I'll, I'll see you in person sometime soon. Awesome. Thanks for your time, Steve. You got it right. Have a good day. Go to rhaccelerator.com for a full library, other podcasts, and to join us on RHA Online.